Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We will be starting in two minutes. Okay, a pleasant uh, day to everyone, wherever you are in the world. I'm Dr. Michael Joseph Dino from the Arledia Fatima University in Valenzuela City, Philippines. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. Missy and I are very much excited to share with you some of our best practices in online teaching and learning. In the next few minutes, we'll be sharing some tips and tricks to make our students more engaged in the learning process. So before we begin, let's start and review some basics and important considerations in designing online learning environment through a self-assessment activity. So let's have the poll now. So I would like to know, how will you describe most of your students in your class? So I would like you to answer this poll. So most of my students, whether it's on campus or online, are type of learners according to the VARC model of type of learners. So option one is visual. Our students need images to understand concepts. So for number two, most of my students learn best when information is spoken. Read and write, prefer to, to receive written words. And uh, of course, learn best by recreating and practicing. And that is for the kinesthetic learners. So let me see first, what are your responses for that? Wow. So based from our quick poll, so most of our learners are visual and kinesthetic and few for auditory and of course, read and write. So that's uh, really amazing. So this COVID-19 pandemic has generated a lot of challenges for us educators, just like in the regular in-person classrooms. And we would like our students to be engaged in the learning process. So can we go back to the slides now? So in designing online learning environments, every educator must place his or her students at the center of the learning process. And we must know how they will learn best, their preferences, including their primary and secondary characteristics. You must also take into account the available media and other resources. And I do understand that we are teaching in different contexts and learning environments. So most of us are working in high-tech, high-connectivity setup, while others are actually working on limited resources uh, in terms of technology and connectivity. So basics for designing online learning environments is to know your learners, to know your course, know your media, and of course, learn your resources. Okay, so in whatever situations, most educators must ensure that we plan and prepare and we stimulate the senses of our students. So based from a Chinese adage, tell me I might forget, show me I might remember, and involve me I understand. By this I mean, we use different kinds of media. For some of us who are delivering online through a learning management system like Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, it is important that we include some resources that the students can see, can read, view, hear, and experience. So we need to take into account the level of knowledge and prefer higher order thinking skills, especially for our adult learners, specifically in the nursing profession. And from my own experience, I prepare teaching resources using different apps and applications. So modules are very common these days, especially for independent and self-directed learning. So videos are very much useful. So in this case, uh, I can use the screen recording pictures of PowerPoint and iMovie to finish, uh, to finish the the videos, podcasts generated from GarageBand and Audacity are some of my favorites. And this is useful for, for those students who are auditory learners and with limited internet and data capacity. So the use of virtual reality and augmented uh, reality are becoming more and more prominent these days. And my students love it. I remember offering an online class for a group of students under the ecological aspects of disaster class. So this is a, 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 stu a students in the undergrad. And what they did is to download an application, view it in their VR glasses and using their devices. Then after that, answer some questions related to the learning experience. In online learning, since the teacher is physically away from the students, establishing presence is very much important. We need to make our students feel that we are with them and with their classmates. Orientation and kickoff programs are very much useful to know 
uh, our expectations and what the students will experience. So for example, in our university, we do a lot of kick kickoff sessions before the online term comes in. We do online bring me sessions and the uh, educators must communicate either synchronously or asynchronously using a variety of teaching tools. So as you can see here on the slide, these are some of the most common uh, applications and online platforms that I'm using for both synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning activities. So personally, the use of social networking sites are vir as virtual common areas are also commendable. The breakout room feature, for example, for Zoom is also one of my favorites. So establishing online activities will definitely engage students. So creating groups is particularly useful to establish teamwork. Gamifying your online classroom is also possible by giving them tasks to accomplish, which is very much important. So where you can give them rewards or electronic badges that they can post in their LMSs or social networking sites. So at this point, I'm excited to share with you some of the online applications that I'm using. So first is Mentimeter. So Mentimeter is an online tool to make your online classes interactive. So I'm using this to understand what my students think of a certain concept. So the basic plan is free, and the following video is a walkthrough on how you will use it. Word Cloud is my favorite for this particular application. And uh, when you, of course, for example, select Word Cloud and you put there your question. So, for example, how will you describe nurses during the COVID-19 pandemic? So what you're going to do is to click on the share button and you will see there, of course, the code that you can share to your student, even the QR code. Then during the online class, you share your screen and uh, of course be amazed of the responses of the students that's popping out on the screen so for this you can see the number of students who are already responding and the bigger the text it means a big number of students are actually uh, having the same answers and i really love their answers for this particular question they view nurses during the covid 19 pandemic as heroes as brave caring lifesaver and of course understanding so this is a Mentimeter. Can we go back to the slide, please? So another new application, uh, of course, that uh, we discovered weeks ago is the platform known as the Perusa. So this platform is free for educational institutions worldwide. Can we have the next slide, please? So Perusa is a platform is free for educational institutions worldwide. So this is a social e-reader and it's particularly useful if you want your students to collaborate and brainstorm online on a particular article from you or from your university databases. So I use uh, Perusa for most of my nursing research class, especially for literature reviews. So let's all watch this video a simple walkthrough on how you're going to create your first task for Perusa. Input the necessary information and select the institution from the drop-down menu. So if your institution is not listed, you can contact their support and they will be glad to include you in their university list. So as you can see here, I'm setting up the parameters for, for the task. Okay, 
So, for example, for, for my online class, I usually have around 20 to 35. And you can select the target group size. For example, if you want to have five per group, you can do that. And um, the thing is, for Perusal, you can link it with your learning management system. Okay? But if that is not possible, you can actually upload your own documents. For example, a publication or an article in the open source um, arena that you can, of course, uh, share to your students. So for this particular example, I'm sharing uh, one of the articles, an open source article that I published uh, several years ago. And uh, that's it. So you can, of course, uh, share the link to your students. Okay, so you will be prompted to, to, to share a code that you can share to your students so that they can work collaboratively in, their, uh, in, in the article that you have uploaded. So for example, uh, for the next slide, okay, as you can see here, this is an example screenshot of the uh, perusal. Okay, so as you can see here, every member of the, of the team can, can do some sort of notations and can, can, uh, they can also do some sort of markups on the article. As instructors, we can also give them some sort of open-ended questions for them to, to check or to reflect on their understanding of a specific passage. The final application that I want to share with you that can make your students more engaged, especially in your synchronous online classes, is I think not new to us. Um, uh, this is very much common, especially in higher education institutions. So this is Prezi. But I'm very pleased to inform everyone that Prezi now has um, a new feature. So by using Prezi video, you can share your slides in different way to show the slide content popping up in your video field. You can do the setup first uh, from your resources, for example, from your existing presentation, and it's ready to plug into Zoom using the Prezi desktop app. Let's all watch this video. Okay, so I don't own this video. I actually got it from, from the official uh, Prezi network. Okay, so previously we are using, of course, uh, the traditional slides during synchronous learning. But of course, by using this, um, this new Prezi feature, you can actually uh, sync it with your online learning, uh, online learning uh, technologies that, that you are using and see, of course, the, the, the PowerPoint presentations or the slides popping up on your video. So can we go back to the, to the slides, please? Okay, so for this instance, I recommend, of course, uh, downloading the application for desktop and, of course, for, for your mobile phones or any uh, platforms or devices that you are using. So summarily, making our students more engaged in online learning requires initial diagnosis of their learning preferences, the available resources, and our capacity to develop these online learning tools. So cool applications are useful, but they are not always effective. Remember that. So we need to uh, prioritize pedagogy and our students before technology. We must always place our students at the center of the teaching and learning activities. Coining the famous concept, non multa sed multum, our students need not many but much and deserve quality instructions over quantity. I want to finish my cards with, of course, another poll. And this time, I want us to reflect on ourselves as educator. Can we pull up the poll, please? So for this, as an educator, I want you to reflect on yourselves and identify if you are an explainer, knows my craft but limited in pedagogy. Are you an involver, knows my craft and pedagogy? Or are you an involver, knows my craft, pedagogy? and my students. So I'm excited to, to see. Okay, so can we see the results now? Okay, so that's great. So most of us are enab enabler, some of us are explainer, and 20% are involver. 
So let's go back to the slide, please. So now more than ever, nurse educators should also be lifelong learners. So we must know our craft, pedagogy, and develop within us care and concern for our front learners. We must offer the caput or the mind, the core or the heart, and the manus or the hand for teaching and learning in online environments. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I'm Dr. Missy Stack, and Michael did a great job of really um, laying out a lot of the theory behind what we do in online learning environments. Um, and I'm excited to share with you some of the very tangible things that we have started to use in our nursing classrooms. And um, really the ideas for me when it comes to technology integration and in, in engaging in online education has to do with um, who is in our classroom. And who is in our classroom right now is um, several different generations of learners as well as several, diff several different generations of faculty. And under trying to understand based on that what kinds of things may be effective. And you may have um, students in your classroom, like as you were discussing earlier in one of Michael's poll questions, that are visual and auditory learners. But then you also may have a large proportion of students who are um, those kinesthetic learners who can't learn by sitting in a classroom. And so the interesting thing as we're talking about online education is that we should be able to transform some of the things that we would normally do in a synchronous classroom environment into a more meaningful experience in, in the online environment. And I know that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. The idea that like, oh, well, we can make online better than what in the seat maybe. But I think in um, the form of some of these examples that I'm gonna give you tonight, you will be able to maybe think about how it might be a more meaningful or a better experience for your students in an online environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna talk first about um, a tool that Michael introduced in, in um, one of his software slides, and that's Flipgrid. I'm not sure if any of you are using Flipgrid, but um, I do have a quick question about um, a poll for you all before we get started in some of these um, on some of these slides. So how many of you are using any of these modalities in your classroom? Are you using discussion boards, any sort of return demonstration, debate, um, or any of these kinds of strategies in your courses? So are you, are you using them all the time? Are you facilitating in-class discussions? Um, are students coming to skills labs? So go ahead and answer this question, and then I'll give you some really great solutions about up-leveling. Great, so there's a few of you out there that are always doing these things, and some of you are never doing them, but that middle of the road where you're frequently or occasionally doing things, I think that some of the tools that I may give you may actually help to encourage some of those things um, in your online environment. Perfect. So Flipgrid is a um, free, which is always great in nursing education. Um, agnostic, which that mean that word means it works across platforms, uh, web-based um, application, software application that helps with digital engagement in the classroom. So when I'm giving this lecture in front of a group of people, I can usually say, like, how many of you use Flipgrid? And I get lots of nodding heads. Um, and traditionally, what people in nursing education use Flipgrid for is for discussion. So Flip, Flipgrid is configured as a whiteboard where a faculty member can pose a topic and then a student can post a video response. And each one of the grids that's built within Flipgrid can be embedded then into your LMS as a, as a web link. It doesn't matter what your LMS is, it can be Blackboard or Moodle or D2L, but you can take that link for Flipgrid and embed it into your LMS, which will be easy navigation for your students. Your grids can also be password protected. Um, and they and you can also limit the access to specific users. So that makes it a very secure solution. And for those of you who are using Teams, Flipgrid also has a Microsoft Teams integration. So those are all great um, tips and things for you to know. 
the utility of Flipgrid is way beyond just discussion board. Um, when I started using this tool in my classroom, I used it for discussion board primarily um, because it was great to see my students' faces and to really hear what they were passionate about. Um, you get a lot more emotion um, in a video chat than you would um, just by reading somebody's words on a page. So I really liked to use it because it showed me how my students were engaging. But what I've started to do is in it, to integrate Flipgrid in um, skills demonstration situations, um, in simulations where students have to demonstrate how they would take a history or do a review of systems. Um, so in a, in a much different way, since we can't be engaging in a traditional um, in-seat or in-person lab. I gave you a link here, which is how to get started. And I know that after the webinar is over, there's going to be a resource sheet that's available for all of my slides, and I think Michael has sent some as well. There'll be uh, web links that you can follow that are gonna be your how-to guide to get started with some of these tools. So don't be alarmed. Uh, we're gonna provide you with sort of a step-by-step -step process of how to start integrating these kinds of, of tools in your classroom. Can I have the next slide, please? There it is. So these are screenshots from my Flipgrids for my health assessment class. And so what we have done here is I have built one grid called health assessment. This is an advanced health assessment class for master's students. And so far in the class, it has three topics. The first one is assessment of the abdomen, then assessment of the cranial nerves, then assessment of the cardiovascular system. So when you go into Flipgrid and you set up your grids, you can name them, you can provide any kind of description that you'd like. Um, there are several actions that you can, um, that you can include when you're building your grids. And you can add multiple topics. So if you see, I have these three topics here. You can just continue to add topics. So for health assessment, I'll continue to work my way through the body systems and I will have a topic for each one of the body systems. The other great thing I love about this is you can co-teach really easily because if you see in this little slide, there's a button with, a, with an airplane by it that says add a co-pilot. That's your faculty. So you can add other faculty to help facilitate these, especially if you have a large section of a course and you um, aren't going to be watching video all day and all night. Um, the other thing, too, is that you can export all of your grid data um, into Excel or into numbers to show how many hours students spent engaging in your grid, which is great when it comes to understanding online engagement in a class like this. Um, so I'll take the next slide. Thank you. So this is once you clicked into the assessment of the cardiovascular system, what the faculty can do is they can drop in an exemplar video or an explanation of what you'd like the student to do. What I've done is I've dropped in a video that the students can watch to learn how to do their cardiovascular assessment. And then if you see um, here, I've added a description. In the, in the grid, the students have to demonstrate the correct assessment of the cardiovascular system, and I give them two minutes to do it. So they really have to understand that assessment in order to shoot a two minute video. Um, it will allow them to go a little bit over, and you can set the length of the video that you want the students to upload um, for, up to, I mean, I wouldn't suggest going um, much further past 10 minutes, but two minutes is a great option to get your students to be able to do health assessment, because then once they put all the components together, their full assessment could take 20 minutes. That is reasonable for a novice person doing a full health assessment. So, the, and I also included here, have they had certain diagnostic um, features that they had to cover that included like PMI, lung sounds, and other essential components. So I gave them a video and then I asked them to post their own return demonstration videos. The other great thing about Flipgrid for all of you educators is that you can create your own rubrics right within Flipgrid. You can customize them. So here you can see I've turned on um, these four components. So did they demonstrate critical thinking? Did they demonstrate the correct assessment? Did, um, did they submit their Flipgrid on time? Did they use appropriate techniques? And you can give a certain number of points for each one of these. Um, rubric categories, which is fantastic. The other piece of that is that students can either log into Flipgrid to get their, um, 
to get their feedback, or they can also, um, you can email it straight from Flipgrid. So the only downside that I have seen with this is that I then have to transfer my grades back into my learning management system, um, but I tend to um, sort of keep two windows open at the same time and add them back and forth. But this is a great uh, tool that Flipgrid offers us um, in order to uh, do some assessment of the student's work within Flipgrid. So the next um, activity or, um, or active learning strategy that I would really like to, um, to stress with you is um, stop motion video. And stop motion video is um, it's a tool. This is iPad and iPhone only, so I'm sorry for those Android users or PC people out there, um, but there are other apps that can be used, but stop motion um, is a full feature movie editor. And what we know is, is that some students are not successful with traditional classrooms, and they can't sit in a lecture or recitation-based room. So stop motion video is really an adjunct to traditional didactic content, and it allows students to integrate kinesthetic learning for difficult concepts. So it uses the theory of constructionism, where students are are learning through production-based experiences. So they're expanding how they learn. And what I'm gonna show you is an anatomy and physiology example that um, students used a pre-created set of materials to create this learning tool. And so these types of opportunities can be used in two ways. One is that the faculty can shoot their own stop motion videos and use them as an adjunct within their courses, or students can create their kits and shoot their own stop motion videos as an assessment of whether or not they've learned a a difficult um, concept or um, for us to use it as an assessment point for, let's just say in this case, physiology. So what we know is that even when we use lab time, it can constrict the student's learning to whatever defined activity it is within the lab. So what, I'm, what we hope to do with stop motion is to integrate hands-on activities that allow students to creatively solve their own learning challenges and, so, and be able to use an evidence-based pedagogy to do so. Again, I gave you a link here that is for stop motion that will help you get started. And I also provided some additional resources uh, on the resource sheet. So what, what do you have to do to set up stop motion? Um, there, are, there are a couple of things, and this will tell you kits, color plates, and setup. But um, what, what happens with stop motion is you have to plan, or the students have to plan. And planning is the, major, the first major step of this. Um, the pictures that you see are kit development of um, a stop motion activity that was on fetal circulation. So students had to have this um, picture of the baby here on the left and um, just show all of the different structures, lungs, heart, liver, et cetera, and all the major vessels. And then on the right, far right, you'll see all of the different labels and arrows and things that may eventually make their way onto the baby to label the anatomy. And then in this particular example, the students use these little red fuzzy balls, craft balls, and they traced the circulation. And if you were to see the stop motion video, you would see that they show you what fetal circulation looks like. Um, so in the middle here, this is what the setup would look like. You can see the picture of the baby and the placenta that's on the iPad screen, um, and then the setup underneath the bed on the table. So you do have to assemble kits, um, but the kits can be reused. Students can assemble kits for you in your first few learning environments and use those for upcoming classes. Um, kits include things like labels, photos, drawings, any kind of background, craft items, things you would find in a maker space. Those are things that can go into your kits. So um, let's, I have a, an example here, and this is a, um, a kit that was done by a student about erythropoiesis.
So from that video, you can see it's only about 37 seconds long, but the students are really able to show you that they understand the physiology that goes into that process. So they're taking what they might have learned in a textbook book or in a lecture, and they're translating it into, into a kinesthetic activity that really helps the concept stick in their brain. Um, and I have lots and lots of examples of these. We've done them for fluid um, and electrolyte balance. We've done them for circulation. We've done them for um, the electrical activity through the heart where the lightning bolt comes in and it hits the heart and it shows you the um, SA node and the AV node and the, um, and the bundle of his and the right and left bundle branches and how that electrical force causes contraction of the heart. So there are lots of ways to make a stop motion uh, really applicable and really meaningful for students. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is whiteboarding. And I know that this concept isn't necessarily new for anyone, um, but whiteboarding, as we used to do it in the classroom, either on dry erase boards or on chalkboards, or um, if you go way back to those overhead projectors that we used to have in the classroom, um, a whiteboarding has changed now with how we teach students online. And whiteboards allow you as a faculty to use visual cues to help students learn. So they do offer an improved um, learning through increased participation because you can allow students to use the whiteboard or you can, as the faculty, can use them. Some LMS have integrated whiteboards. Blackboard Collaborate has an integrated whiteboard, as does D2L. Um, but the big features of whiteboarding, if you're looking for a good whiteboard, is that there should be an unlimited canvas. So you should be able to draw um, as long and as much as you want. Um, your whiteboard should have a collaboration feature. So you should be able to collaborate in real time. You should be able to see comments from the users. Um, you should be allowed to um, cloud share and file share and sync across your devices. Um, in addition, you should be able to attach files to your whiteboard and then have several options for presentation. So you should be able to share your whiteboard right there synchronously or actually use it in an asynchronous environment. And so for those of you who are wondering what I'm talking about, for those of, if you've used Khan Academy in any of your courses, that's the best example of how you can use a whiteboard effectively. What I have done with whiteboarding has to do with an app called Explain Everything. That is not the only um, whiteboarding mechanism that there is. Like I said, that there is a lot of them in the learning management systems. But on the resource list, I also provided you a great list of available free uh, whiteboarding apps that may help you. So I'm going to show you an example of what whiteboarding can look like in an example that I have that's on um, the menstrual cycle. I'm a nurse midwife, so I'm obsessed with the menstrual cycle. I'd like to do a quick review of the menstrual cycle. So in a normal cycle, what we call normal, quote unquote normal, is 28 days. And so we're gonna look at what happens with hormones between day zero and day 28. So we have two phases of, as a, of the menstrual cycle. We have the follicular phase and we have the luteal phase. And the follicular phase is dominated by estrogen and the luteal phase is dominated by progesterone. And then we have two other important hormones FSH and luteinizing hormone. So let's start in the follicular phase and I'm going to show you what happens with estrogen. So estrogen starts at a steady state here in red and then when we get closer and closer to ovulation we see this spike in estradiol and then again it kind of comes down and Oh, so I could talk about the menstrual cycle with my students all day long, and I could um, drill the names of hormones in their heads. I could show them all of the algorithms. But the first thing I can do is take this is actual the length of this video is actually two and a half minutes. I can just take two and a half minutes and show them what happens in the menstrual cycle between day zero and day 28. Then 
I can give this whiteboarding file to my students and ask them to recreate it. Do you understand what happens with estrogen and progesterone? Do you understand what's follicular and what's luteal? Do you understand what happens with luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone? So whiteboarding is a great option as an adjunct to your teaching to keep your students involved, to help them create their own materials that will expand their understanding. So I hope that these three big examples, that's Flipgrid, stop motion animation, as well as whiteboarding, can help to increase um, the engagement of your students in an online environment. Okay, well, thank you, Missy and Dr. Dino and Dr. Steck for speaking with us regarding those topics. We do have um, some time now that we would like to take some questions from the audience. Um, so feel free to enter your questions now and we will address those. So one of the first questions that I see here, um, let's see. A question about Flipgrid. Can Flipgrid provide a list of all the students and grades? Missy, you wanna take that? Yeah, I can. Um, you can get, you can show all of the rubric scores for all of your students, if that's what you're asking. It just, it will give you a list of all of your students. It just won't allow you yet to integrate them into your LMS. Which platform would be best to teach vaccination techniques? Oh, oh, vac is it vaccination techniques? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, I think it would be, I am a really strong um, advocate for anything that you can take a video of. Um, and, you know, even our phones have fantastic um, capabilities for video. We've come such a long way. Um, so I think that teaching techniques and and it, it's great to be able to just video, like do a demonstration for a, um, for a student and then post it. That allows the student the opportunity to keep watching it over and over and over again or use it as an adjunct to a synchronous session where you say, here, we're gonna talk about this, and um, here's my video of how I can show you how to do it. But then I think you could use Flipgrid um, for return demonstration. If you wanted your students to be able to demonstrate that they understood your teaching, then Flipgrid would be a great place to do that. Thank you. Do you know of any online programs similar to LMS that learners need to log in and view presentations or complete coursework, et cetera? I do. I'm going to answer and then I'm going to let Michael add into this. Um, I really like Nearpod um, as an option that looks like an LMS. Um, you can provide videos and lessons and interactive quizzes. There are a lot of different options in Nearpod and um, Nearpod has gotten um, way less cost prohibitive, I would say, in the last um, few years. And they've been really great since COVID hit. Um, but Nearpod is a great suggestion that's LMS-like that allows all of the features of what an LMS would give you. Michael, do you have any other suggestions? Uh, yes. Actually, in the Philippines, before we uh, convert to Canvas in our university, we're using a lot of open source um, LMSs. So one of which that we find uh, very effective is the use of Google Classrooms because you can set up your students, you can invite your students on the class, then after that you can upload your resources for the students and even link it with other applications in the Google Suite. So for example, if you want to do an online uh, exam for them to, to check their self, their self uh, understanding of, of a particular topic, we're using Google Form. And if, they, uh, if you want your students to upload their own videos, for example, so you can use the Google Drive. So uh, being seamless is very much important in online learning so that the students will not go into to different applications at, at the same time. So it should be uh, compatible to, to one another. So for that, we're using Google Classroom, uh, which, is, which is linked with a lot of applications available for Google. Um, also, if you're in an Apple school or an iPad supported program, you can also use ClassKit from Apple that also does have a lot of features that look like a, an LMS and have lots of options for interaction. Can students work virtually as a group with stop motion or do they have to be physically together? They have to be physically together to do stop motion as a group. Um, 
how you could split that up could be that students could each do a part of a video. For example, you could divide it up and say, maybe there are four parts of this function that I want you to describe and students could divide those up into part one, part two, part three, part four. But in order to do one full video, they need to be in one physical location. On stop motion, what is the appropriate way to give prompts? At the graduate level, I would think you wouldn't want to be too simple. Any guidelines? I think it depends on what you want to, um, you, what, how important it is and what um, components you want to include. So for example, that, that erythropoiesis, right? That's an undergraduate concept. Um, but you needed to, um, they needed to understand the anatomy and the physiology that went along with that, as well as all of the um, uh, transmitters, et cetera, that made that process happen. But the way you can um, frame your stop motion projects is to provide just a detailed rubric of what it is that you want them to include. If you want a certain level of detail for them, then certainly put that in your rubric. I think that's um, a reasonable um, expectation you can give rubric points for, did they identify the, the appropriate structures? Did they um, identify their right physiologic response or, or pathway? Did they identify, so in the end of that video, did you see how it said, these are all the reasons that we would need erythropoiesis? It told you, so you would say in your rubric, hey, you have to list all of these reasons. So I think you can be as specific as you'd like at the graduate level in terms of what you want them to include. With stop motion, do you send the students the kit or give them directions on how to make their own kit? That's choose your own. That's choose your own adventure. Um, if you, some students are frustrated by the idea that they have to create their own materials, um, but you could send them um, digital materials that they could download and then um, just print off and use, cut out, etc. But some students really like the challenge of being able to do that themselves. So the nice thing is, is that if you created PDFs that had all of the cutouts, et cetera, in them, um, that literally the students would print them off and cut them out and be able to use them right away. And you could reuse those materials over and over and over again. Um, so I guess it's it's kind of up to you. If you um, if we do get back to a place where we can be in the classroom and you can create, and or even in a hybrid where students are going to come to class for I don't know, a day every month or a day every couple of months, you could certainly put materials together and send them home with students. So I think that there are a lot of options as to how you approach putting together those kits. Are there any apps or platforms that students can use for writing a research paper that work with any LMS? Uh, I think uh, I can answer that one. So for, for our students during this pandemic, we're using the, the, Google, um, uh, the Google Suite again. So one of that is the document feature wherein uh, they can collaborate online in, uh, in developing a certain uh, manuscript for that. So what we do is we meet the students, for example, for a particular group. So we set our expectation, we set our intended learning outcomes. Then we go live by, uh, of course, um, logging in at the same time at the, at the Google um, uh, document. Then after that, we, we set instructions to our students. In rural areas, my students can only use WhatsApp on a phone. Is there anything that is appropriate for them, or do you know of any platform that will synchronize with WhatsApp? I don't have any tangible solutions for integration with WhatsApp. Um, it is great for the students to be able to, you know, at least communicate with one another, you know, via the app. Um, I don't have a good solution. I do know um, that Microsoft Teams also can be downloaded to a phone and has some really great collaborative features. So if you're in a Microsoft environment in your university, that Teams is great because it's agnostic across devices. So you might see if those students in rural areas can use Teams as a collaborative platform. Um, and I also had another addition to um, Michael's conversation about Google and research papers. Um, on the OS side, so on the Mac side, um, students can use collaborative pages, which is the Word version, the um, micro or the Apple version of Word pages, um, has a collaboration feature where students can be working on a paper at the same time. They can also share it with their faculty um, for feedback. 
So do you some have a favorite? Our, yeah. So some of our faculty are, are, are using uh, WhatsApp as a form of communication outside the learning management system. So what, what we're doing is that for the WhatsApp, we give them um, reminders on what they need to do. And uh, we also post there some important links that they need to be accomplished, for example, within that particular week. Do you guys have a favorite platform that you use to create a MOOCs course? Is this, is it mocks? Is it like the m m massive online courses? Is that what that refers to? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, what's what's great about our learning, can, can the person who asked that question, can you tell me what learning management system you're using? Is that possible? Yes. Let me reach out to that individual. Um, as I'm reaching out to the individual, I'll ask you another question. I'm not tech savvy. Is there a platform you recommend using first? <laughs> Michael? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? So he's asking about. Yeah, it says, I am not tech savvy. Is there a platform you recommend using first? Okay, so in terms of the learning management system, I think uh, one of the most user friendly is the, is the Google Classroom. Yeah, but as you go advanced, you, you can, of course, use other uh, learning management systems. So particularly in our university, we're using Canvas management system. So the uh, ad adoption among faculty is, is, is quite uh, gradual in terms of how I can create, of course, assessment tasks within the, within the platform. How can I, for example, create my modules that can be uploaded in the platform? So basically for a starter, so I recommend using Google Classroom. Also, for somebody who's getting into something new, um, Michael mentioned this in his presentation, that the pedagogical strategies are really more important than the actual technology. Um, the technology kind of comes with that. Um, and if I had a SAMR wheel, I would show you that, but that's the substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition model. Um, and really, if you take what you're doing in a traditional classroom and you decide you're going to flip the script on it, the SAMR wheel is a great place to get started. And I can add that to our resource sheet. Um, I'll just give you a really quick example of that. I am very tech savvy, but I was still doing a lot of very traditional teaching 10 years ago. And I really was started to think about what my pain point as the faculty person was. And my, my real love of technology integration started with a transformation of one assignment. Um, and that one assignment was a paper that I hated reading and I hated grading. And I turned it into a TED Talk for my students. And it's still, to this day, one of my favorite things to watch, um, two-minute TED Talks from my students on, on a particular topic. And um, it's still, I, I think, one of the biggest successes I've had in my classroom in terms of real redefinition of what I did to improve engagement in my class. So um, as you're getting started, if you're not tech savvy, really just start with something that you find painful or that your students find painful and maybe just start to work on that one thing. Thank you. Do you have a favorite platform that you use to create the massive open online course and they use Canvas? Okay, so Canvas can, like a lot of the LMS can support massive, these massive online courses. Um, but if you're trying to do something collaborative, um, and you want to do it in an um, in a synchronous or asynchronous way. Michael has a, a long list in the presentation of synchronous and asynchronous um, softwares. Um, you know, Zoom and this GoToMeeting, et cetera. Some of these online platforms have um, the ability to host um, thousands of people and thousands of students. Um, and um, as Michael was saying, with um, Zoom, you can use the breakout rooms. Um, you can. There are several features that are useful in those massive courses. Michael, do you have anything to add? Yes, actually, for for the Zoom, uh, for the uh, uh, Canvas platform. So, if you want your courses to be to be open to all, you can actually publish it in the Canvas Commons. Okay. So, if you want to share it with other educators, you can just uh, put there the course, and they can easily adapt it to, to their classes. We're having issues with student engagement during remote clinical debriefings. What is your favorite platform or app to use during online clinical debriefing? 
So one of the tools, actually one of the strategies I feel like that's really important when you're trying to engage with students is the idea of differentiated instruction. So that means that you're providing information in the, uh, um, in the same information in a lot of different modalities because you need to engage every kind of learner in that environment. So whether that's you're doing your um, debrief of your clinical day and online and you're you're showing a brief video, you're doing a quick whiteboard, you're facilitating a discussion and asking questions within that discussion. I think you have to understand that their attention span, which we know from the literature, is about three minutes. So you have to change direction of what you're doing in those situations pretty frequently to keep people engaged. Michael? Uh, for my students in the clinical area, we usually uh, do some sort of online portfolio. So once they, for example, expose in a certain experience, so they do a lot of uh, uh, recording. Uh, they do have uh, voice recorders, they have pictures, they have videos, and after that, they put it in one place. For example, we have the cloud, uh, the, the cloud storage now that are very much, of course, um, useful. So what we, we're doing is that we are creating the same folder, a same folder for all of my students. Then after that, within that, they have the different groups and they put in their um, electronic uh, notes. Then after that, they do some sort of a summary. What is the advantage of using Flipgrid over just uploading videos as Blackboard assignments? The grading, um, the, the evaluation of the videos in Flipgrid is very seamless. Um, when students upload, first, when students upload their videos to Blackboard, there's bandwidth issues, so you don't have as much, much flexibility of the amount of time or the amount of bandwidth that somebody can take up in a learning management system. So in Flipgrid, you don't necessarily have that problem. Also, when you have them upload into Blackboard, you're clicking in and out of individual assignments all the time. It's a lot of clicks to get all of them graded. Um, in Flipgrid, you have them all in one synchronous line. You just go from one to the next to the next, and you can see all of the responses on the screen as you scroll down. So I think it's just ease of use, as well as bandwidth, as well as being able to customize um, all you know all of the features. Um, the other thing is if the students upload them simply to Blackboard, then they can't. They're not. Op there's no option for real peer review within um, Blackboard as a if you're submitting it as an assignment. So in Flipgrid, they could do peer review, um, and they they can be open to other students' comments. So I think that that's an advantage. Do you know if these platforms have been updated to the new APA format? So platforms don't necessarily um, conform to APA in terms of formatting. I'm kind of confused by that question. Um, I think so, I need a more clar think, clarification, but Michael, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, are you referring to the American Psychological Association format, the APA? I believe that's what we're referring to, but I can clarify. I can move on to the next question. Yeah, what okay, you clarify? Sure. If, is, if, if that is the APA format, I think you need to, to use an external application for that. So, so for example, for us, we're, we're actually using a lot of uh, external apps uh, for that. So we are using Zotero. Zotero, based on, from my experience, this is the uh, bibliographic uh, databasing applications that's free. And uh, once you, for example, uh, obtain an, ex an external link, you can just create an APA style reference using Zotero. Thank you. Are these resources available in different languages? For example, like Spanish? I know that Flipgrid is available in Spanish. Um, and I think it, it depends on which applications that you wanna look at in terms of, um, of other languages. I'm, I, I am not certain about stop motion. Um, Michael? Yes, actually, this is as a common concern for especially during uh, international webinars just like this one. So for us, uh, in our situation, so we we urge them to use the translate um, the trans translate feature of Google. So because, for example, if the website is not written in Spanish, the website is not written, for example, in, in Bahasa in Asian countries. So I uh, I'm advising uh, these instructors to use the translate. Uh, 
the translate uh, option of, of Google so that they can use it seamlessly. So once you use it, for example, on your mobile phone, you can just take a, a video or a picture of, of the site and it, it can translate, especially when you are using it and you don't know what this button means. So you can use the Google Translate app for you to easily understand what the button is all about so that you can use the application even if the controls are in English. What are the challenges and issues you've experienced in Flipgrid and Google Classroom so far in engaging students? My first struggle was getting students to actually want to be in front of the video. Um, and I know a lot of you are probably familiar with I'm having a Zoom meeting and I don't want to turn my camera on. Um, the phobia of being in front of the camera, that's really been the biggest struggle. Um, but really students have gotten over that after the first um, assignment. They're sort of timid and shy, but then I think once they see everybody else do it, they've really flourished in that environment. Okay, in, in my case, I think uh, the common challenges that we're encountering is on the technology side. So for example, in developing countries such as the Philippines, uh, it's not as, uh, of course, um, tech, techy as compared with other first world countries. So we're, some of our students are having problems in terms of the devices that they're using. Not all of our students have laptops. Okay, so based on the survey that we conducted, so uh, some of our students are using only their, their mobile phones. And in terms of internet connection, uh, our internet connection is not that good as compared with other countries. So we need to consider these things uh, to make everyone, of course, engage in their learning process because some applications might not work and some applications might work. So in our uh, university, we do have uh, a research um, portion, a research department was actually doing a lot of studies uh, for us to be able to understand the needs of our students on how many uh, gigabyte of data if the students will be, for example, immersed in a Zoom session for an hour. So we do something like that. What would you use for a course that you are creating outside of the LMS? I would have told you iTunes U until today when they told me they were sundowning it in 21. So that is my favorite non-LMS place to build courses. Um, but I'm getting more comfortable. I, I have I've built some courses in 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 Nearpod, and I've built some courses using um, some of the features that are built into Pages uh, for i or for Mac OS. So for Apple, um, Michael. Yes, uh, in my case, I used Nearpod also previously, but of course, uh, during uh, for the learning process, I think it's very much important to to focus uh, our attention on only one, uh, for for example, um, a collection of of uh, technologies that 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 we can use. Yeah, but for at present, I think it's the best uh, Canvas and and Google Classroom, especially for starters. How effective and reliable is the assessment tool in Google Classroom? like in giving an exam to students? Okay, so I think it um, it has something to do with how are you going to create your assessments? Okay, so of course, if, for example, in Google Classroom, you're going to, to give um, an examination, okay, uh, a multiple cho choice uh, type of questions. So my suggestion would be for the instructors to create a blueprint first. What are the things that you really want to assess? And as much as possible, you don't actually um, create uh, questions that can be answered easily by the students by simply uh, using Google, etc. So we go higher order thinking. So for example, on my MCQ, I put their uh, scenarios, clinical scenarios, real world scenarios. Then after that, the students will be able to, uh, to pick which is the best intervention that the nurse could give. So uh, I think uh, the key is on the planning and development of that online assessment. So we need to consider the blueprints, the intended learning outcomes, and of course the type of question should not, cannot be easily uh, searched from the internet. So it needs to be real world, okay? So you can put there some sort of scenarios where the students can reflect on their practice and choose the best answer among the choices. When integrating these platforms into my classes, do you recommend a gradual incorporation of the platforms or a complete classroom flip? I think that depends on the environment that you're in. Um, 
I have done all of the integration that I have done over the years um, gradually. Um, and I've started, so for example, if I have three courses that are being offered in one semester, then we transition those three courses. And then we sort of follow the courses through as we, as we transition. But as an individual faculty person teaching a class, I did not ever take an entire class and decide, oh, I'm just gonna totally up-level all of this using some sort of technology and some sort of different platform. I sort of strategically replaced assignments and assessments in my courses um, until I felt like I had a really nice mix of things that would benefit all of my students. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I strongly agree with Misi on that. So, for example, from from a personal um, for a person from a personal instance, we do the technique known as desensitization. Okay, so when we say desensitization, that is the gradual exposure of a person to a threatening experience or or object. And in terms of the learning process, not all of our uh, instructors, for example, in the colleges of nursing, are are adept in terms of using technology. So the gradual exposure. To, to, to each of, of these technologies would be very much uh, important. So one by one, you're trying different things. Then the next day or the next week, you're trying different things until uh, the time comes that you can successfully integrate all of these technologies. Thank you so much to our presenters today for all of this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with this audience, and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. As a reminder to our attendees, Please submit the state or country you are from in the questions feature. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars and podcasts are freely available on Sigma's repository. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening.